So it's my really great pleasure to welcome our second keynote speaker, our very own AI Lab alumna, Professor Melanie Mitchell. Uh, Melanie has received her PhD from Michigan in 1990 uh, when she studied with uh, Doug Hofstadter and John Holland, and she developed the copycat architecture. In fact, Melanie was here at Michigan when the AI Lab was born. Uh, since then, uh, she went on to make many fundamental contributions to AI, uh, including on genetic algorithms. Uh, she has a book on that, um, and thinking actively about common sense knowledge um, and abstraction and analogy making. Uh, she's also the author of a recent book on AI uh, entitled AI, A Guide for Thinking Humans. Um, and this is one of the books that I enjoy the most on AI. Um, I feel it's very skillfully, skillfully keeps a balance um, between presenting the latest in AI, uh, but in a way that's really um, approachable for a broad audience. So I'm very excited to have Melanie with us today and very excited to hear from one of the top AI experts and on why AI is harder than we think. So Melanie is all yours. And a reminder to the audience to please um, type your questions in the Q&A and we'll address them uh, at the end of her talk. Thank you, Radha. It's great to be back even virtually at, at U of M. Very thrilled to be here. Let me try sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about why AI is harder than we think. So many of you have seen this uh, progression of promises of self-driving cars, uh, man many um, news media and other experts predicted 2020 was going to be the big year for self-driving cars, that we'd have 10 million self-driving cars on the road, or uh, Elon Musk back in 2019, promised a year from now, we'll have over a million cars with full self-driving software, everything. So that didn't seem to happen. We don't have a million or 10 million or, or huge deployment of self-driving cars. Now, one AI researcher made this comment, perhaps expectations are too high and this will eventually result in disaster. Suppose that five years from now, Funding collapses miserably as autonomous vehicles fail to roll. Every startup company fails. There's a big backlash, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this condition is called the AI winter. So actually this was written in 1984 by Drew McDermott, an AI uh, researcher at Yale. Um, but you can see that these kinds of sentiments echo even now, you know, he's even talking about autonomous vehicles failing to roll. Uh, we've seen these, these uh, continual uh, cycles of extreme optimism uh, that is often followed by disappointment and promises not being met in the field of AI. And people have called these, you know, the AI springs and AI winters. When I actually graduated from University of Michigan in 1990, AI was suffering one of its winters. And I was advised by some people not to even mention the term artificial intelligence on my CV. So that, that's kind of how it was back then. Nowadays, things are uh, not quite so dire, but we do see some echoes of the past. So let me just uh, go back in time to 1961. Claude Shannon, pioneer uh, in AI and inventor of information theory, claimed that he expected within 10 to 15 years, we'd see something that's not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. Um, a few years later, uh, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner in economics and another AI pioneer, claimed that within 20 years, machines would be capable of doing any work that a man can do. Of course, you know, the sexist language kind of is very uh, salient back then. But anyway, you get the general sentiment. And Marvin Minsky, founder of the MIT AI Lab in 1967, claimed that within a generation, the problem of creating AI would be substantially solved. 
So none of these predictions obviously uh, came true, but we still see today quite optimistic predictions that kind of echoes these past ones. Well, first John McCarthy said one of the problems why these didn't uh, come true is because AI was harder than we thought, which is certainly true. But again, we're seeing some predictions like uh, Shane Legg, co-founder of uh, DeepMind, uh, back in 2008, said that human level AI will be passed in the mid 2020s. Mark Zuckerberg in 2015 um, said that one of Facebook's goals for the next five to 10 years is to basically get better at human level at all of the primary human senses, vision, hearing, language, and then general cognition. And uh, Stuart Russell, author of one of the most prominent AI textbooks said in his recent book, he asked, when will super intelligent AI arrive? Probably in the lifetime of my children. So he's saying his timeline of 80 years is considerably more conservative than that of the typical AI researcher. Well, it's certainly more conservative than these two people, but it's still uh, within the lifetime of his children will super intelligent AI arrive. Maybe many people think that that will be the case, but I do think that we do we suffer from certain fallacies in our thinking about AI. And I'm not just saying like the news media or the general public, but all of us, all of us AI researchers also are um, susceptible to certain fallacies. The first fallacy is that progress in narrow AI is on a continuum with progress in general AI. So we see things like um, claims from IBM saying that uh, Watson, for instance, is a first step into cognitive systems, a new era of computing. And by cognitive systems, they meant something like uh, human level AI. DeepMind and uh, other groups have said that Al Alpha Zero is the first step in creating real AI or GPT-2 is a step towards general intelligence. You know, these, these steps, the, the, this, this language of first steps is um, this idea that we're on this continuum as we make prog more and more progress in these more narrow domains, that's progress towards general AI. Well, the philosopher Hubert Dreyfus, um, who is a very eloquent critic of AI said before all of these statements were made, he, he identified what he called the first step fallacy which he said is the claim that we've been inching along a continuum at the end of which is AI. So any improvement in our programs counts as progress. But he asserts that there's a discontinuity in this assumed continuum, which he calls the common sense knowledge problem. And I'll talk about that uh, a little more towards the end. And his brother, Stuart Dreyfus, an engineer, made an analogy. He said, it's like claiming the first monkey that climbed a tree was making progress toward landing on the moon. So that's the idea that um, this progress that we're seeing in uh, these more narrow domains maybe is not, is not a, a continuum and there has to be some kind of uh, qualitative leap off that tree back down to the ground maybe and then in a rocket ship to land on the moon. A second fallacy is that um, easy things are easy and hard things are hard. And what I mean by this is that we often assume that things that are easy for us will also be easy for machines. And that things that are very hard for us are should be the hardest grand challenges for machines. So Herbert Simon, for example, um, once said, everything of interest in cognition happens above the 100 millisecond level, the time it takes to recognize your mother. So all of these things that happen below this level, this sort of unconscious perception, he is stating that's not really of interest. It's not that hard. We don't have to worry about it in modeling cognition. Um, and more recently, Andrew Ng, uh, AI uh, entrepreneur and um, one of the pioneers of deep learning, stated something similar. He said, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. So it's sort of echoing that view that all of these unconscious thought is not what we really have to worry about. Those things that are easy for us 
will be easy for machines. Uh, a more subtle version of this is Demis Hassidis, uh, the, one of the founders of DeepMind, who said that Go is one of the most challenging of domains. So uh, certainly for humans, it's very challenging. But the question is, is it one of the most challenging of domains for machines? And Gary Marcus, uh, another critic of, of, of AI, made an uh, analogy that he said that, well, if you look at games like charades that any six-year-old can play, that actually is a much harder challenge for machines because it involves um, all kinds of linguistic skills, um, bodily um, ability to, to um, imitate, ability to have kind of a theory of mind. So Go may be one of the most challenging of domains for humans, but the fact that uh, machines have now conquered Go doesn't necessarily mean that they're able to do the things that are easy for us. And this was summed up a long time ago, often called Moravec's paradox after Hans Moravec, uh, a roboticist and writer who noted that it's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on IQ tests or playing checkers, or you, you, know, you can update that with playing Go and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. And I would add common sense to that. Marvin Minsky, later after his uh, predictions that didn't come true, he noted that one of the reasons that we um, think that we, we suffer from this fallacy is of course, we're least aware of what our minds do best. Um, the third fallacy is what I'm calling the lure of wishful mnemonics. I got the term wishful mnemonics from again, Drew McDermott, that Yale researcher who wrote a paper in 1976 called um, Artificial Intelligence Meets Natural Stupidity. It's a very um, prescient and insightful paper. I, I highly recommend it for people who work in AI. It's a short paper, but the idea here in his paper was that we, we, we tend to um, use sort of anthropomorphic language when trying to describe what our programs do. And he warned that if you, for instance, call the main loop of your program understand, you might mislead a lot of people, including yourself, into thinking that it might it, that your program is actually understanding. And McDermott said you should instead refer to this main loop as G0034 and see if you can convince yourself that it implements some part of understanding. And McDermott went on to say many instructful, instructive examples of wishful mnemonics come to mind once you see the point. So this is still true in our modern age, many decades later. We have a lot of modern wishful mnemonics. For instance, in machine learning, often the benchmark data sets are named after the skills that they purport to test, such as reading comprehension, common sense understanding, general language understanding evaluation. These are actual names of benchmarks that people compete on. And in fact, machines have actually exceeded humans on many of these benchmarks. However, and uh, this leads to the idea that, you know, headlines like machines are better than humans at reading comprehension because machines have exceeded human performance on a benchmark called reading comprehension. So these are what I think of as actually really strongly what McDermott was warning against in terms of wishful mnemonics. Um, and in fact, um, a recent paper uh, asserted what I think should be our mantra in thinking about these machines. We should not confuse performance on a data set with the acquisition of an underlying ability. So the general language understanding evaluation is a data is a benchmark for um, language understanding and machines have exceeded humans on almost all of the tasks in it. And yet machines still don't understand language in the way that we do at least. So this is uh, important uh, to be aware of this. Even more sort of fundamentally, we call our methods deep learning or neural networks when actually what the machines are doing is very different from human learning or uh, the, the, the neural systems in our heads. But 
we then um, give the impression that they are actually doing what we think of as learning, or they actually are very brain-like, which is, I think, often quite misleading. Uh, finally, we, we make over attributions in descriptions of what machines have learned. This is kind of what McDermott was talking about. So here's an example from uh, DeepMind's uh, work on um, deep Q learning, where they applied deep Q learning uh, to um, Atari video games like Breakout. So here you have this uh, video game where you have a paddle that hits a ball, the ball bounce, uh, the ball. Um, collides with these bricks and explodes them. And you get points for um, the higher the brick is, the more points you get. And so the machine um, learned this strategy, which here's how they described it, DeepMind described it. It exploits the optimal strategy, which is to make a tunnel around the side and then allow the ball to hit blocks by bouncing behind the wall. Okay, so that is certainly how you would describe the, the strategy if a human did this. But the question is, did, did the machine actually learn these concepts, concepts like tunnel, ball, blocks, or wall? Well, it turns out that if you change the game a little bit, and this is what uh, a group did in 2017, showed that if you just move the paddle up by a few pixels, uh, a deep Q ne network that learned to play the game on the standard version of breakout and did and learned that strategy and does extremely well on this version cannot transfer it to this version. If you apply the machine that learned on this version, it doesn't play the game well at all. It can't implement that strategy on this version, which sort of implies that it actually didn't learn the same concepts that we attribute to it, like tunnel, ball, wall. It's, it's learning pixel, uh, pixel configurations in a video, but it's not really learning the concepts that would allow it to successfully transfer what it learned to a, a very similar situation that any human would be able to transfer. So there's many other examples of wishful mnemonics in the in the popular press and also in, in, in the sort of AI literature. You know, we hear things about IBM Watson that it can read all of the healthcare texts in the world in seconds where the term read is actually, you know, it brings in ideas from what human reading is, which implies sort of understanding what it read instead of simply processing text in a certain way, or Watson understands context and nuance in seven languages. These are all press releases from IBM Watson or from DeepMind, AlphaGo's goal is to beat the best human players, not just mimic them. And the idea of a goal, a machine having a goal, has connotations of the human idea of goals, which this machine doesn't have at all. It doesn't even have any idea of what beating the best human players means. Uh, and there's many others. I don't mean to pick on IBM or DeepMind. Uh, many different companies and research efforts uh, speak in this kind of anthropomorphic way. And the question is, is this an inevitable shorthand or a misleading anthropomorphism that makes us convinced that these machines actually are more intelligent than they, than they really are. Finally, the last fallacy is the most controversial one. And when I published this paper um, on this topic, I got the most flack or kind of feed, uh, you know, negative uh, pushback on this the idea that intelligence is all in the brain. So here's uh, you know, the classic Newell and Simon physical symbol system hypothesis uh, is that um, you don't need something like a body for intelligent action. You, um, you can kind of sift off the symbol system from the brain and the body um, and build it in a machine. More recently, people have been doing things like estimating the, the, the computational capacity of the brain and asking how close are we in AI to sort of recreating that computational capacity. So this, this particular um, researcher estimated 10 to the 15 flops uh, per second um, 
is enough to perform tasks as well as a human brain, given the right software. But, you know, there's no body here. It's just the brain. And Jeff Jeffrey Hinton, a uh, pioneer of deep learning, said that, you know, to understand documents at a human level, we're going to need what he, when he calls human level resources, which is to him sort of a brain capa uh, like capacity. He says, we have trillions of connections in our brain, but the biggest networks we've built so far only have billions of connections. Um, so we're a few orders of magnitude off, but I'm sure the hardware people will fix that. And um, so this is sort of assuming that once we get to this capacity that is like our brain, we'll be able to build human level AI. And, you know, what's the magic hardware bullet? Maybe it's quantum computers. So people often ask me, you know, is our quantum computer is going to solve AI? Um, I don't think so. But many people in um, cognitive science have doubted this sort of fixation on the brain alone, sort of a disembodied brain, and talk more about embodied cognition. So that's the idea that. Um, cognition is distributed not just in the brain, but throughout the body, that it's the combination of the two that enables human-like cognition. Or um, from a neuroscientist, you know, there are no brain parts for disembodied cognition. Every part of the brain is implicated in sensory or motor, motor systems. Um, and Lakoff and Johnson's famous uh, thought, uh, thinking that our complex and high level concepts are all grounded in physical body uh, centered metaphors. So this is controversial, whether it's true or not, but I do think that there is a good argument that it's not disembodied brain like neural networks that will get us to human like cognition. So finally, some open questions, you know, if narrow AI is not on a continuum with general AI, how do we actually assess progress in our field towards general or human level AI? If easy things are not easy for machines and hard things are not hard, how do we assess the difficulty of a domain for AI? How do we actually talk to ourselves and to uh, the general public about what machines can and cannot do without fooling ourselves with these wishful mnemonics? And how embodied or socially, culturally embedded does intelligence need to be? I don't think any of us have the answers to these questions, but I think they're important to um, make progress on if we are to have a much better assessment of where we are as a field and how close we are to say general, more general intelligence. So, I'll conclude with talking about what I think are some of the major open challenges that we have to um, deal with in AI. Of course, few shot learning is extremely important. You know, we can show a human um, just a few examples of a, a concept like bridge and humans are quite good at picking up what is going on and what these concepts are really about without having to see millions, thousands to millions of examples. So that's a challenge. Generalization, of course, is st still a big challenge. Um, you know, even if you've seen all these bridges, like I just showed you, you probably can recognize this as a bridge, even though it looks very different from the ones that I've shown you. Or even more abstractly, um, this is a water bridge, where the sort of bridge idea is inverted rather than a sort of a concrete structure here going over water. It's water going over a concrete structure. So this is a bridge for boats rather than cars over a highway. So we humans are really flexible and good at this kind of generalization. Um, but this is something that machines still struggle with. And this is very close, of course, to abstraction and analogy, which is what I'm working on in my, my research. So we can abstract the idea of a bridge to say something an ants, ants make with their bodies to cross a gap. Or we can talk about bridging your hands or the bridge of a nose or the bridge of a song. We can sort of use these concepts more and more metaphorically and understand in a very fluid way what, 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 um, what this all means. You know, people talk about bridging the gender gap Joe Biden 
um, promised us that he was gonna be a bridge to a new generation of leaders. Uh, we, we can understand these metaphorical notions of bridge um, very easily, but this is all still a challenge, big challenge for machines. And you know, you can just go on and on about different concepts of bridge and bridge is not any special concept. You can do this with virtually any concept you wanna look at. So this is why Hofstadter um, defined a concept as a package of analogies. And you can see how that, that definition, it sort of go, goes beyond, you know, a concept is not just a word, it's really a big kind of halo, as Hofstadter used to like to also say, of, of analogies. Another challenge, of course, is um, transparency and bias in our, the, the, especially in machine learning systems. So for, as, as an example of this kind of non-transparency, um, this is a very simple example. One of my students um, trained a deep neural network to decide if an image contained an animal or did not, okay? And was trained on a um, whole set of uh, nature photographs and did very well on this task. But when he, did some analysis, like looked at, looking under the hood of how the machine was making these decisions, he found something surprising, which is that the machine was noting that there was a correlation between blurry backgrounds and animals being in the image, because of course the photographer is uh, focusing on the foreground when there's an animal and on a landscape photo, there's no, no, an, no foreground really so the background is clear. And it's a lot easier to, for a, a neural network to recognize blurry versus not blurry than animal versus not no animal. So it's using that, what people call shortcut to do well on this task, even though it hasn't learned the thing we wanted to teach it. And this happens throughout machine learning. You know, for example, this group back in 2018 showed that um, deep neural networks that had learned to recognize objects like fire trucks with very high confidence, 99% confidence. If you photoshopped the object in weird poses, it was the very confident this was a school bus or a fireboat or a bobsled. So it, these kinds of weird uh, classifications show that the, these machines are not learning to recognize objects in the same way that we humans recognize them. They're learning certain features that um, correlate well with their training data, but often they can be brittle when um, faced with uh, things that are outside of their training distribution. And, you know, when we see things like Tesla's crash on autopilot crashing into stopped fire trucks, which has actually happened more than once, we see that this kind of brittleness is often can actually have real world um, implications for deploying AI systems. And we've all seen the kinds of biases that these systems can have in terms of attributes like gender, skin color, age, and so on. Even maybe more alarming is there's the susceptibility of these systems to adversarial examples like this famous one of putting stickers on a stop sign to um, fool a self-driving car into thinking that this is a speed limit 80 sign. It's been shown that that's not hard to do and to get at, even at different distances and angles from the stop sign, the system is, um, pretty successfully fooled, this is the thing in parentheses is the confidence that this is a speed limit 80 sign. So these kind of engineered um, adversarial attacks are one of the things that I think we really do have to worry about in deploying these systems. And it's because they don't actually understand their data in the same way we humans do. So this, you know, understanding and common sense is what Hubert Dreyfus was talking about. This is kind of what his obstacle was in this continuum. Uh, and I think it's very clear that, you know, 
AI systems are still lacking this kind of understanding or this kind of common sense knowledge of the world. So just as to continue on the self-driving car example, it turns out that um, the most common accident for self-driving cars to be in is humans rear-ending them. Okay, and, and that's because they often slam on the brakes unexpectedly because they perceive something as an obstacle that no human would perceive as an obstacle. You know, for instance, might be a floating bag in the road um, or, you know, a tumbleweed out here in New Mexico. We see some of these. Uh, should you stop for a flock of birds or do you know that the birds are going to fly away? You know, should you stop for um, a pile of glass on the road? I, there's all these possibilities that it, it's hard to know you know, in advance how to train machines for, but, you know, should a machine worry that this snowman is going to dart out in the middle of the road? So, you know, th this is the long tail of possible cases of weird things that can happen. And those um, are what common sense allows us to deal with that machines are lacking. So obviously common sense is a very big, buzzword now in the field. A lot of people are pouring a lot of money into getting machines to um, have common sense. So Paul Allen, before he died a few years ago, you know, endowed, further endowed his institute in Seattle to study common sense. The, the U.S. Department of Defense is putting a lot of money into machine common sense. Um, in fact, one of their projects is what's called um, Foundations of Common Sense whose goal is to get a machine that has the common sense of an 18 month old baby. So that's a big contrast with, you know, if that's a grand challenge, that's kind of more of X paradox showing that, um, you know, even though we have machines that can do incredible things like, you know, beat any human at go or translate between languages and um, do speech recognition and all of these achievements and yet they don't have the common sense of an 18 month old baby. So here's a nice example I found just looking at this, this photo. I found this photo on the internet and like thought like, what, what, would, how, what would a self-driving car or any kind of um, AI system have to understand to make sense of this kind of image in general? Okay, so there's a lot of things that we humans bring to our understanding of the world you know, we, we have a sense of intuitive physics. We know how objects interact with each other. Um, we know um, the, what happens, you know, what, what we can expect to happen when the woman say pushes on the stroller. We have a sense of like what living systems do. We know why this dog has its nose to this post. We know what's likely to happen when she pulls on the leash. We know, have psych, uh, intuitive psychology. We know like we can probably sense from body language that these two people don't know each other. They're not gonna stop and talk. We bring all these, this knowledge to predict what's gonna happen when, in a situation we face, which is absolutely essential for dealing with the real world. You know, we, we bring mental models of cause and effect and vast world knowledge. You know, we can sort of instantly spot that this woman is distracted. She's not looking at, uh, tra oncoming traffic, she's on her phone, even though maybe we can't see the phone, uh, all kinds of things. And we're able to abstract by analogy uh, prior situations that we know about to understand new ones. And these are all things that um, are big challenges for uh, machines. These have been challenges since the first days of AI. So this is uh, the first, the abstract from the uh, proposal for the Dartmouth Summer Workshop on AI. This proposal was written in 55. The workshop happened in 56. You know, these are some of the people who started the field. They thought in a two month, 10 man study would um, produce a lot of progress in the field. And they outlined some of the problems like how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts. I'm just talking about solve kinds of problems reserved for humans and improve themselves. And, you know, this, these are all open, remain open questions, but I think this one is the biggest one. And just to quote Hofstadter again with his colleague, uh, Emmanuel Sander, 
he said, without concepts, there can be no thought and without analogies, there can be no concepts. And I would add to this that how to form concepts and make analogies are the most important open problems in AI. I wrote, wrote extensively about this in my book. So if you're interested in, in um, more discussion of this, um, I can recommend it. And thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you so much. This is a wonderful talk, very thought provoking and um, really raising a lot, of, um, a lot of questions about where we are and where we are going. Um, and I see there are questions coming in and I encourage people to type their questions um, in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of the screen. So um, one question is um, around the wishful mnemonics that you brought up and asking whether you have suggestions of how about how to go about naming this task without using words like understand, read, and so forth. It's really difficult. Um, and I don't have a good answer. I think we just, you know, uh, there was one book, a recent book on AI by the philosopher Brian Cantwell Smith, which, which was called The Promise of AI. And it was making some similar points. Uh, and in there, he every term like understanding or recognition, even things like that, he he made he put little symbols on the word to show that it was machine rather than human, and it was quite awkward. <laughs> he was trying to be very precise as a philosopher, but it was a quite awkward to read. But um, I, so I'm not proposing that, or that we every time we um, talk about what machines do, we put put the words in quotes, which may be would be, uh, you know, uh, another version of that. But I think we just have to be, be more, much more aware. And maybe when we um, say name our benchmarks, uh, we don't confuse the actual task that we're asking the machines to perform with the name of the benchmark, because it's, you know, like reading comprehension. It's not always the case that the actual task um, matches what the, the name of these benchmarks are. So, and this is something we've been learning more and more that these evaluations that we're giving to these machines are not capturing the tasks that we're thinking that they do. So I don't have a great suggestion, but I think it's something that we should definitely be talking more about and thinking about. Yeah, and I agree that part of the reason we have this hype is because of this ultimately misunderstandings of what is meant and what people perceive from the outside. Um, there is another question um, around analogies. And there are two parts of this question. First, uh, to what extent you think that systems like GPT-3 are actually able to understand analogies between concepts? Um, and then second, um, how would these um, analogies would help us build intelligent systems? Those are great questions. So, so GPT-3 um, it, it, it is a very, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. It, 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 can, it can make analogies that are sound human-like, just like it can form sentences that sound human-like, but it's not hard to kind of show when you probe it more that it's not really understanding the text that it's dealing with at least in the way that we do. So it's easy to make it break in some sense. Whether or not, you know, GPT-5 or GPT-6 or whatever you want to call it will, will you know, with more and more data uh, achieve that, I doubt that it will. But I think, you know, a lot of people in the field are confident that that scaling approach is the way to understanding. I don't think so. I think, you know, as for analogies, so if you think about analogy in a very broad sense, that is recognizing essential similarity between dis different situations um, or concepts, that's sort of at the root of all of our intelligence. You know, we want a, a, a self-driving car to be able to recognize a situation where it should stop and where it should, should keep driving. Okay, uh, very abstractly. And the way that we do that, I think, is very much through unconscious analogy, through our ability to say, oh, this is a certain kind of situation that I've seen before, even though 
in all of its details, the situation is different, but we're making an analogy. So I think a lot of language understanding is based on analogy, um, visual understanding and so on. So I think it's gonna be absolutely essential ability for us to get machines to be able to make analogies in a human-like way to have machines that can deal with us in the real world. Thank you. And um, yeah, I, I, I agree that it's really getting us like being able to do these analogies will really get more to the kind of sort of thinking that we do, like doing some kind of reasoning, um, which we don't seem to have a lot of focus nowadays um, in AI. It's more like um, being able to recognize things as opposed to to reason about analogies and how you could use what you already know to perform other tasks. Uh, there is another question uh, somehow related, um, referring again to language models, again with the example of GPT-3, which can reach high accuracy on various, I'm now afraid to say natural language understanding, but the so-called natural language understanding benchmark task um, in zero shot or few shot settings. Um, and the question is, um, what do you think about um, what these results actually mean for um, understanding, like what the true natural language understanding process, like what, what do these results actually mean? Um, yeah, I, I'm fascinated by these language models because they're so much better than I would have ever guessed they would be at certain kinds of tasks, yet they're still brittle, you know, and you can show they're brittle on many of these tasks that even they do well at, meaning that they, they can make er non-human-like errors. Um, and it's also the case that some of the tasks themselves have been shown to allow for certain kinds of shortcut learning, like you know what I, the example I gave with the, with the fuzzy background. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the, for instance, there's this, uh, as I mentioned, there's this general language understanding evaluation uh, data set, which is called glue, or and then there's another version called super glue, and there con consists of a bunch of different uh, natural language uh, processing tasks, but people have uncovered shortcuts that allow machines to do well in these tasks without actually um, performing the language understanding that you know you might think they would need. So it's a big challenge now in natural language, the natural language processing community to, to come up with better evaluations. And I think this is something that people are talking quite a lot about in, in natural language processing, especially given that these language models are now, you know, doing really well on these tasks, the question is like, what are they actually learning and how do we evaluate them in a much more rigorous way? I think, you know, there's a, there's a whole sub field now uh, called, like people call it BERT, BERTology for BERT, you know, the language model where they study sort of what is it BERT, BERT, what are the representations this system has actually learned and how is it making its decisions? And it's very non-transparent. GPT-3 is a, uh, you know, harder to study because it's not, we don't have an open source version of the code, although people are now kind of recreating GPT-3. But there are language models like BERT, Roberta, all these different, you know, names that um, people are kind of studying as a scientific artifact, like, you know, how do these things work? And nobody really knows. I think it's really interesting. So I don't think these systems understand in any like interesting sense of understand um, I think it, you know, it's an open question how to explicitly probe that, you know, to really decide that that's the case to do a test. But um, I think that's something that we're all going to have to be grappling with more and more. Yeah, and it also brings, I think, interesting questions on evaluation is indeed a very big problem. And then if we find ways to evaluate the evaluations, then of course it will be sort of become recursive. How do you know that those are actually good? And um, it's a very interesting space, um, but I, I very much agree that that's something that we'll have to start thinking more carefully about. There is another question, which is sort of questioning um, the goals that we currently have in AI um, in the sense of why do we even use humans as the benchmark in AI? And for instance, what do we, why do we need a machine that has common sense? Um, and instead of striving for this human-like general AI that would understand, quote unquote, the world, 
Um, should we instead focus on narrow models that ultimately learn to perform a targeted by useful task very well that would augment um, human experience? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. And, and I think there's several parts to that. One is like, why, why should we care about human common sense or human understanding? And I think it, it sort of depends on what we want the machine to do. You know, there's, there's uh, tasks like, like the recent work on protein folding with alpha fold, you know, surpassing all of the human teams in predicting protein st structure, essentially because it doesn't, didn't think like humans. It was finding patterns that no human would ever find. And so that was its you know, superpower, was being able to be non-human-like. On the other hand, with like self-driving cars, if they generalize in a non-human-like way, but they're interacting in a human world, they're gonna fail, they're going to be in accidents. So in tasks in which we have kind of humans and machines working together, you have to have some kind of common understanding of, of the world. Um, so it really depends on, on the task. And, and I think the second part of the question was, um, why not just have narrow, focus on narrow AI and tasks, you know, applications that augment human intelligence? And I think that's absolutely maybe the right way to go. On the other hand, a lot of us got into the field of AI precisely because we wanted to understand like how to make machines do the things that humans do more generally and to understand human intelligence by trying to recreate it in machines. So that's, you know, a more kind of scientific orientation than a more engineering orientation is to sort of say, let's, let's just build useful um, applications. So I, I think there's a lot of different people in the field with different goals. And, you know, I, the, the idea of general, building general human level AI, I think is a, a valid and fascinating goal that motivates a lot of people. Not necessarily, maybe it's you know going to end up being too dangerous or too um, uh, uncontrollable or too biased or what have you to be useful, but I think it has a potential to be you know something that lets us understand ourselves a whole lot better. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> All right, thank you. And I actually have a follow-up question to that. My my own question, thinking about this more like task-specific AI, where self-driving cars is such a task-specific, so it's not general AI, it's really going after one task. How can we go about having a closer alignment between societal needs and what we as a community work on? Um, and with no offense to those working on self-driving cars, I think those, I mean, it's an excellent goal, but seems to be overemphasized, um, which, for instance, the pandemic uh, showed us that there wasn't necessarily sort of the major problem that we have had to solve. Maybe would have benefited more from having some solutions for homeschooling or for patient care or who knows, other things, not self-driving cars. So how can we think about having this closer alignment between what the society needs and what we work on? Wow, that's a really hard question because it gets into the whole economic structure of capitalism and what have you, <laughs> motivations for building, you know, companies and so on. But, um, you know, one of the things that I think is a problem is that AI is, is both both the, the sort of engineering side and the more scientific side is, is, is dominated by computer scientists and other sort of more engineering science type people. And there's a lot of room for social science in AI that I, and maybe philosophy and other fields that should have a, big, a, a, a more prominent seat at the table to help us understand what are the problems that would be most useful? What are the implications of using these systems in the real world that I think there's a, you know, a, I've been interacting a lot with people in social sciences who have a lot, a very different perspective on a lot of these issues than um, kind of the computer science and so on, you know, and there's a 
people in law, in medicine, in all kinds of fields who I think could contribute a lot more to this conversation. So we really need to make discussions more interdisciplinary. And I, I very much agree with that. I think that would really be beneficial for everyone, including the computer scientists in AI on how to think about, uh, about problems. Um, so I'll move on to the next question, uh, which is um, going back to this concept of analogy and concepts. Um, and is a very specific question about asking who, what are some of the names that we should be following the work of? Aside from yourself, of course, <laughs> you've been working in this space. Uh, do you have recommendations for other researchers who are active in this space of um, analogy? Yeah, so there's a, a, a lot of people working on analogy. There, there's people um, in from cognitive science, people from sort of more traditional deep learning, there's a group at um, DeepMind, uh, actually several groups who are working on analogy. Um, uh, th there's um, groups at Google, uh, group, groups at like Stanford, all over the place. Um, if anyone, there, there's something called the um, Analogy Seminar, which is some uh, online seminar that's open to anyone that I participate in where people are giving, um, lectures kind of across disciplines in, in analogy, including AI. Uh, if anyone's interested, feel free to email me, um, mm at santafe.edu, uh, and I can give you a pointer to that or other work on analogy. So happy to do that offline. All right, thank you. And the question asker, I'm, I'm sure um, they will reach out. Um, in this same space of analogy, there is another question on um, whether possibly um, deep networks are actually learning more general concepts in their intermediate layers, but perhaps the current generation of deep networks has no way to combine those concepts across applications. And so determine which generalization are, are useful and which are not. So what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think that there's a lot to be done in understanding what deep learning systems are actually learning. Uh, and I've certainly seen a lot of uh, claims for systems learning abstract general representations, especially in um, you know, areas like what people call meta learning, where you're actually training a system to learn better, as well as to learn specific tasks. Um, and um, in uh, systems that try and kind of combine sort of neural and symbolic approaches. But yeah, I think it's, it's wide open. Right now, um, often it's, you can show that deep learning systems do have the kind, this kind of brittleness that um, I, I've talked about earlier. But you know that it's still very these these systems are very large. They're not very transparent, and I think it's important to, for us to understand better exactly what it is that they they learn, either you know that allow them to generalize or allow or you know make them vulnerable to to uh, brittleness. Thank you. Um... I will ask a question. Well, there is a question which I'll just reproduce here about another um, aspect. So we've been talking about analogy, but there is also the um, safety and fairness. And many of the concerns that were raised in the presentation about AI would align with concerns about um, machine learning safety or fairness. And given that these systems, some of these systems at least are, are in common use, um, do you have any thoughts about how we can safeguard against AI failure um, in systems that are already in use? Um, yeah, this is a very big topic of, of discussion now in the AI community and in the government. How do we safeguard systems that we don't understand very well? How do we make these systems more explainable? How do we make them more trustworthy? Um, I, you know, that, that's a very open question. You know, the European Union adopted this, um, you know, their GDPR uh, data protection, which in 
part of which was that AI systems, any algorithm that has sort of makes decisions about somebody's life, like giving you a loan or offering you a new job or whatever, has to be explainable. But what does it mean to be explainable? You know, that's another, that's kind of a philosophical question. It's explainable to whom, in what way? Uh, and um, it turns out that the more, ex there seems to be some kind of trade-off between accuracy and explainability, some people have shown. And so these are all like really hard questions. And, you know, how do you do like program verification on a deep neural network? No one knows the answer, but I think, you know, it's it's, there's a lot of important research on that. I think we should be very careful about deploying these systems widely without getting some answers to that. And it, we've already seen a lot of harms that have been done by say, deploying facial recognition systems when they're not robust, they're not trustworthy and they can be biased. So there's gotta be some regulation. There's gotta be some kind of stand, re regulation of standards of testing and evaluation, but I, you know, it's kind of the wild west. No one really knows how that's going to, to shape up. Okay. And I have just one final question, which may or may not be the, the punchline. Um, the question is asking about um, whether machine common sense and will come from better understanding of humans or human common sense. We don't really know enough there either. Um, so really, the, the question is whether breakthrough in AI will come from the life sciences or from computer science. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think it's, a, I, I think it's, it's not an either or, you know, it's probably both. There's, a, you know, the DARPA program I mentioned on machine common sense is very much focused on developmental psychology, which is trying to get uh, like neural networks to go through the same developmental stages as a baby does and get, therefore, you know, learn the same concepts, hopefully. Uh, I, whether that will work, that's, that's an open question, but I think there's been a lot of innovation in, in computer science and in machine learning, for instance, that, that can contribute to thinking about how babies learn also. So I think it goes both ways. So that's why, you know, I, when I joined the field, AI was very much a part of cognitive science and there was a lot of interdisciplinary interaction among these fields. Then the field kind of went, became dominated by more statistical approaches, including deep learning. Um, but I do sense kind of a return to the more interdisciplinary um, focus of the field, the re realization that we do need to have insights from biological learning and in fact, biological science, including neuroscience can, can also learn something from uh, AI. And that's been a really fun aspect of, of being in this, this whole area. Yeah, and I agree. I think it's a, it's a great time to be in AI. And also part of that great time to be in AI is also this growing interdisciplinary collaborations, which um, I believe will take us closer to understanding um, AI and also um, how we function as humans. So thank you again for a wonderful talk, very inspiring. Um, and um, we invite you to join us for the Birds of a Feather session at 3.30. Melanie will be there and happy to answer more questions and have a, have a conversation. Um, and before we move on to the next session, I would like to remind you to please vote um, for the best poster. Uh, we'll, it's really just a one question on the forum, so we'll take you probably 30 seconds or so. Um, and with that, thank you again, Melanie, and I'm passing it on to my colleague, um, Ben Kuypers, who is going to chair the next session. Thank you. Bye-bye.